uh, the first work we did with the multi-species wards were up on the back of the hill here at Lines behind us. We started the work back in 2012. And up to that point, there had been some work conducted in the country looking at multi-species wards in plots and how much herbage could you grow. And then in 2015 and 2016, Connie Grace, who was a PhD student of ours, and myself and Helen Sheridan and Bridget Lynch, we, we ran a sheep grazing study. And that sheep study, what we saw was we could improve the growth rate of lambs and improve the performance of yews when they were grazing multi-species swords compared to either grass or a grass clover sward. And we're finishing those lambs about two weeks earlier and, and at the time we had also reduced the amount of dosing we needed to do to control intestinal parasites. And that was kind of the, that was the first study of its kind in Ireland, uh, looking at grazing multi-species swords. And we moved on to work then, uh, we repeated that work with, with sheep and we got, I suppose, we managed the multi-species swords a little bit better to favour the herbs in particular and the legumes in the sward. And we were able to reduce the period to slaughter for those lambs then by about five to six weeks. Multi-species swards we use here, they contain grasses, legumes and herbs. So three functional groups are three different types of plants. And we use them in comparison to a perennial ryegrass reseed. So we're not looking at replacing semi-natural grasslands or old permanent pastures with these multi-species swards. If a farmer is making a decision to reseed part of his farm, um, and in the past he may have gone with, or she may have gone with perennial ryegrass, now multi-species swards may be an option for those farmers. When we'd finished that project looking at sheep performing on multi-species swards, we wanted to communicate the results to, to industry and to farmers. So we organised a workshop inside in Belfield and we asked people from various parts of the industry to attend and to, to speak at the event. And uh, Slaney Foods were one of the groups that we invited to participate. And it was from that meeting really then that the collaborations with Slaney, which has now become collaborations with ABP developed. The nitrogen in the multi-species system comes from the legume as opposed to the fertilizer spreader. And that's a, that's a key management difference. So you're not, you're not following each rotation with nitrogen. Uh, here, we don't apply any nitrogen to the multi-species systems after the end of April. So from that point onwards, we, we let the legumes uh, do the heavy lifting. And we have become accustomed over recent years to grazing perennial ryegrass at relatively low pre-grazing herbage masses. You know, we can certainly push that pre-grazing herbage mass a lot more with a multi-species sward without losing quality in the sward or without seeing a negative impact on your animal performance. So they'd be the, the, the three key areas from my perspective. And do you think you'd need maybe a block of ground to graze them animals on rather than maybe a paddock here, a paddock there? Because it, they take a bit of time to get used to it. Even your, your own self getting managing that grass there... Yeah, a very good point, Stephen, and, and th that would be something I would recommend. So if you can establish enough area that you can have a rotation working around that area. So you have one group of stock, whether that's your calves or, you know, a few priority animals, or if it's a sheep farm, you might have your yo lambs who are rearing lambs. So some class of stock that can continue to rotate around that. Because the feed supply that you're giving the animals, it does differ from ryegrass. The rumen will need a little bit of time to adapt to that. So if you can keep a constant supply of that feed coming into your, into your animal, it will work better than jumping in and out, as you say. And then probably another question as a farmer, if you're cutting silage, how, how does that differ? Is there anything I need to do differently, even timings, all that? Because it looks very different in the bale. It, it looks very different in the bale, and it's probably one of the biggest things we have witnessed here with our silages. Um, when we open the, the multi-species bales, they look a lot different to our ryegrass. And when we feed them to the cattle, they perform a lot different. So our cattle on our ryegrass silage, compared to our multi-species silage, those cattle getting the ryegrass silage, particularly in their first winter, they grow 150 grams per day slower than the cattle grazing the multi-species silage. So certainly if you're to judge by looks, you wouldn't be excited. But when you look at how the animals perform, there is a big benefit there from the multi-species silage. When we established the long-term grazing platform, uh, we decided to go with dairy beef animals as opposed to any other type of beef animals. I suppose the, there was two reasons for that decision at the time. We could see that more of the beef slaughterings were going to come from the, from the dairy beef type animal as the dairy herd was expanding at the time. Remember, we were making these decisions back in 2018, uh, 2019. And also for the future sustainability of the dairy herd, we believed it was important that there was a there was a market and a finishing system where these cattle, these beef cattle arising from the dairy herd could be finished efficiently and could return a, a profit for those dairy beef farmers. Over the last 
decade or so, we've we've fed multi-species swords to a lot of different cohorts of beef cattle and a lot of different cohorts of sheep. And we're confident now when we can grow multi-species swords and feed them to meat producing animals, beef cattle and sheep, we will get these positive results in terms of increased animal performance and reduced days to slaughter. And particularly for the beef sector, when we look at the government action plan around how we're going to reduce the carbon footprint of our beef, reducing age to slaughter is one of the key metrics included in, in there in the marginal abatement cost curve and in the climate action plan. So it's another method through which we can reduce age to slaughter. Not the only one, but it is another method how we can deliver that return. But multi-species words, they're not a silver bullet, or they're not going to cure all ills. They are part of a, of a suite of solutions we have. If farmers are interested in establishing multi-species wards, exactly the same type of things need to be considered for any reseeding program. And I would always say that, you know, reseeding should be the last step as you go about improving your grazing land and your grassland management. For multi-species wards or any reseed to be successful, we need to get the soil pH right first. We need to get our P and K indices right. We need to control any weed problems there may be before we establish the multi-species ward because we have no herbicides that we can use post-establishment to control weeds in a multi-species ward. And then farmers need to be conscious of the fact that the chicory and the plantain and the red clover, they don't last in the sward for 10 or 15 years. At least we have no research data at this stage to show that they will. So what we have been doing here is rejuvenating the, the herbs, the chicory and the plantain in particular, after three years. And, and that's worked reasonably well for us so far. So it's a different mindset and it's a different way of growing herbage or growing grass and you need to approach it with that mindset. When we were calculating the net margin across the three different farm types, what we did is we took into account all the costs that went into the system and then we took into account all the outputs we generated from the system. So when we're looking at a system like this, our product is kilos of carcass sold. We were bringing all the cattle to the same level of finish, so our target was a 315 kilo carcass. And then the main driver of that differential in the net margin, we were putting out 60% less fertilizer nitrogen on the multi-species wards and on the ryegrass white clover sward. And also because we were finishing those cattle five to six weeks earlier, we were putting in significantly less concentrates into that finishing period. So when the cattle come into the shed to be finished for their second winter, they get a 50-50 silage concentrate diet. And we're getting six weeks off that concentrate feeding. So we're taking six weeks of five to six kilos of concentrates per day out of the system as well. And that was driving our net margin. And, and maybe just from a, from a farmer's perspective, maybe just what, what is the system? What age are you finishing at? Just, just so a bit of context. Yeah, so you can see in the background, we, we have Hereford steers here. We're, we're targeting, as I said, a 315 kilo carcass. When we started, we were aiming to get those cattle finished about 21, 22 months of age. Uh, what we've seen with the system over the last four years now we're operating it, the perennial ryegrass cattle, which in this experiment have been the poorest performing group of cattle, they're finishing around 21 to 21 and a half months, which is still an excellent performance. And the multi-species cattle, which are the best performing group we have, they're finishing about 19 and a half months of age. So it's exceptionally young cattle like Taurus. Well, I think the key to a dairy calf to beef system is efficiency. Efficiency right throughout the system. In a dairy calf to beef system, your product is kilos of carcass sold per hectare. So we have the platform here stocked two and a half livestock units per hectare, and we keep those cattle performing right throughout the system. So to get a good start to life, we turn them out in the, in the middle of June. Uh, we operate a straightforward leader follower system. You know, some people might be asking questions about that, but the, the calves have priority access to the herbage and then they move when the followers, when the yearlings need to move on to a new sward. And it's worked very well for us over the last four years. It minimizes the groups as well, like doesn't it? Like less, less group, easier manage, I suppose, is it? Well, we have two groups per farm, basically. You know, yeah. and you've one, you, you, you do your movements on one day. The calves move when the cattle need to move. So I suppose, the key question, why would ABP be involved with a, with a multi-species project with you know, UCD and Smart Sport? Um, I suppose it's very simple, like, so I suppose, first of all, uh, it's research and R&D, and it's something we're always heavily invested in. Uh, you know, for the last number of years, it's a key part of our business. We could see real value in this for our suppliers. Like, we have over 13,500 family farmers supplying us. When Tommy would have went to speak to the guys, ourselves and Slaney, a number of years ago, I, I'm going to be openly honest that he's standing beside me, was that I was questioning his sanity. I wasn't sure how it was going to work. And I think 
as a farmer, you know, we were brought up with perennial rye grass, you know, so that was what we were brought up with, it's a new way of thinking and probably question how well it'll work, but I think the results from Tommy, like, you know, 35 days younger, you know, at the same weight, 60% less fertilizer, and, and that whole carbon piece of 14% reduction, like it, it's an it's a it's a no-brainer for us to be involved in a project a project like that like and and I think what Tommy's point is there is that the system again like that it's it's not it's not happened that's really difficult or you know it's kept very simple you know like it's 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 one or two groups of cattle it's you know moving them every three days and it's about getting the basics right like even you know, we would purchase these calves you know that they're you know, get a good health status from a good herd getting well reared, you know, nutrition, and then move on to here. I think when in terms of, we'll say, sustainability and reducing the carbon footprint, you have to start, and, and Tommy jump in, you have to start with the low-hanging fruit. So what can we do on farm that can save us money? You know, that's what you have to focus on a farm point. If you save money, for example, if you can reduce that age of finish or produce less fertilizer, you know, that's the win for the, for the beef farmer. And then what will follow to improving the fish will be a lower carbon footprint. Like so, I think that's that's the low hanging fruit. Like there's additives to come in the future. There is a potential cost for them. So I think you need to start. You know, get your soil your soil health right. Get your grass right. Like so, manage that genetics. They're the key things we can do, and they're they're readily available there to the farmer at low at low cost. Like so, for us and for our farmers, an advantage. That's what we when we talk to them. We don't want to add cost to the system, it's how can we reduce cost. Sustainability has three key pillars to it. You have economic sustainability, you have environmental sustainability, and you have social sustainability as well, which is one that's occasionally overlooked. And that means, you know, the sustainability of the system for the farmers, and also the sustainability of the product that's produced for its consumer further down the line. So there's no point in having an intervention that'll make you a lot of money if it's not socially sustainable or if it's not environmentally sustainable and vice versa there's no point in having an intervention that'll, it's very good from an environmental perspective if it's too expensive for farmers to implement so when we're looking at sustainability we need to look at it in the round and that's what we focus on here with this with this beef system it's a dairy calf to beef system you know from a genetic perspective there wouldn't be the rolled rice of genetics that are coming through but we have focused on getting every piece of the puzzle correct from the time those calves are reared uh, with, with, with ABP and the team. They come in here, they're turned out at, at about 15 weeks of age. And we keep those cattle moving efficiently through every stage of the production system here. The cattle behind me are enrolled in the new collaborative project between ABP and, and Biorbic uh, Research uh, Centre and SFI Research Programme. So Stephen, you know, ABP are continuing to support us in this research, so you obviously see value to, to what's happening. Yeah, look, and I suppose it's probably on the back of the, the really good results that was that was had in the first phase. And you know, I think there's a lot of potential we've seen as a company to, to get more out of this. Like, I think, uh, look, at the minute we're under a lot of environmental pressures in terms of, let's say, water quality, for example. So I think the work that you're going to do on you know, looking at water quality, water usage, that biodiversity piece, it's going to bring, I suppose, bring the project to a whole new level for us and give us great insight. And I suppose the second phase of it, which I think is really important, is getting our farmers, even our farmers in the Advantage program, to adopt that technology. Like so, so bringing our trial farm, which is a bit more commercial maybe than the new CD, seeing how the multi-species sward uh, works there, and getting that information out to farmers. 